good afternoon. Uh, <laughs> as we were getting started, right? No. Uh, I just want to welcome you to our uh, last session of the afternoon, Driving Systemic Change Through Policy and Practice Advancement. Uh, just in keeping with the panels that have come before uh, on today, just a wonderful group of dialogue partners uh, and practitioners who uh, can come together to think about this with us uh, in this space. Uh, we have with us uh, Christopher Bailey from the World Health Organization, as many of you have heard from earlier today. Uh, we also have Anita Chandra uh, from the RAND Corporation who is uh, with us via Zoom. Uh, we also have Deborah Cullinan from Stanford University, and then Sheila Savannah from Prevention Institute. Uh, my name is Patrick Smith. Uh, so we want to just kind of jump in and get going with conversation uh, for today. And I want to begin by just asking the panelists, and maybe if it's okay, uh, starting with uh, Anita, uh, from your work and from your context, what do you see as some of the systemic barriers to promoting health justice, or maybe what stands out to you most in terms of your work? Yeah, thank you for the question. Well, I, I see kind of a few barriers right now. Um, one is that many um, communities are now faced with thinking about equity in the context of health justice in new and different ways. And what that means to not only think about equity centeredness and how we design systems, how we disrupt systems can be very challenging, both in terms of how people operationalize equity in those systems, and then also the legacy and structural and historical reasons why we haven't put equity at the center of some of our systems design choices. So that's one. Another area would be um, in the space of what we measure and what we take account for. Systems often run um, in terms of their performance and the outcomes that they prioritize. And we've not always necessarily identified uh, certain aspects of health and well being in our systems as the primary or the most priority outcome. And so that can be really challenging in pursuing systemic reform. Thank you so much. Uh, Christopher. Well, I, in the world or in the US? Um, well, you, you tell us. <laughs> <laughs> well, Maybe I won't talk about the U.S. right away, but um, I, I, I think in the world of which the U.S. is a part, um, I, I think there's an increasing trend uh, of people defining themselves based on negating the other person. Uh, and we talk over each other, we uh, validate ourselves by disproving or denigrating the other, and uh, I think one of the things that the arts has to offer, um, uh, even at the policy level, is returning to the lost art of deep listening, deep observation, and, uh, and, and this notion of compassion, uh, which comes from the Latin compassio, which means struggle together, finding common cause, even with people that you don't necessarily see eye to eye with. And uh, the, it's... It, it, it's, it's extremely important that uh, policymakers, uh, I mean, policy itself comes from the Greek meaning ways of working in the city. And we, we go back to this notion of how do we work together? What, what are the rules? What are the guidelines? And what can we agree on of, of, of a way of working? Yeah, and I'll just jump in just to, to say that all day today, I think we've talked a lot about what the structural issues are and why we have such a big gap in achieving health equity. So to not repeat, I, I, I've been thinking a little bit about two things. Uh, and one of them is um, that we do not, uh, our systems do not take into account the very people that they exist for. Um, and you know, we, so people don't trust um, don't feel comfortable, don't feel seen or known. Um, recently, uh, I'm, I'm at Stanford and I, and I was uh, speaking with Abraham Verghese, who's a healthcare provider and kind of a genius who works <laughs> Stanford Medicine. And he was trying to talk about the upside of um, telehealth and, and Zoom. A lot of downside, a lot and a lot of downside, but just what silver lining. And one thing he said that may not be a surprise to a lot of people, but that really struck me was um, 
by being able to, to uh, speak with my patients via Zoom, I understood their lives. I could see how they were living. I could see who they were living with. I could see what mattered to them. And that changed the way I thought about my practice pretty radically. So that's one. And the second thing is just, it, it's come up already today. It's not, maybe we don't think of this as a systems thing, but I think it is. It's just we lack imagination. We know. We know what's wrong. We know what's possible. We have evidence around the role of the arts and other things in helping to achieve health equity, but we do not have the imagination to apply that knowledge to shift the systems. And I think that's what we're here to try to keep moving the dial on today. I, and I couldn't agree with you more on those things that have been named. I would add, we don't have patience. You know, um, changing policies, changing norms takes a long time. These are multi-generational issues that we're working with, and yet we want to have a return on our investment within the year or five years. And it's not going to happen in those ways. You know, so we have to be ready to push back against the time frames of what we will see when. And the way we measure it, you know, how we invest in it, um, and really take a long-term plan for creating change. The other thing is, I think, um, when you think about the, even the term driving systemic change, we have to keep accelerating what we do. We can't just push and stop and expect a result. Oh, it's very good. You, you, just in terms of that long-term commitment, I remember hearing someone years ago, I cannot remember where I heard this, but uh, the way he described it was trying to run a marathon through mud, right? Uh, running a marathon is probably hard and long enough, but then trying to do that through mud, right? Also, uh, sometimes he was saying this gives you a sense of the kind of resiliency uh, that is needed uh, in some of these efforts. Uh, now, all of you, or each of you, uh, is doing amazing work uh, in your own spaces. And so, uh, many would say that driving systemic change requires a kind of culture shift, a uh, kind of broad motivation for collective behavior. And so, if you agree with that assessment, how do you uh, do that, um, or how do you attempt to do it in your own work, uh, perhaps? Or if you don't agree uh, with that way of framing it, uh, what else is needed, perhaps? And uh, maybe. Betty, would you mind starting us off? Yeah, I don't mind. Could I show the yes, quick absolutely. picture? I think. So I, I found using art and images helps, whether it's policymakers or community residents or public health officials, open their minds. So a picture like this, which is in the Tenderloin, it's a corner store, there's beer and, and cigarette ads. But what happens when this is where you get your groceries? but also talking to them about how do you go into community and identify the strengths here. How do you also talk about what trust does it take for your children to sit outside and wait for you to rejoin them? Um, to also say what is it to like to have a relationship in a community where you know the people that own the store or run the store or you know that they'll hire your children. You know, so, so just talking about community assets and resources as well as risks, and so being balanced in that. And I think, you know, in terms of creating change and also using the arts with that, is we have to move people to a space where they can imagine, where they can imagine something different, and I think that's what some of the other panelists have also talked about. Deborah, please. Yeah, I love, I love this. Um, it, it brings to mind uh, a project that when I was at Yerba Buena Center for the Arts that we did in collaboration with a number of people to look at neighborhood corner stores that were mostly known as liquor stores and to work together to transform them um, with the owners into places that had healthy food choices. And we worked with students who were artists and writers to help translate the messaging um, in a way that was uh, sensitive to their context. And so, you know, it's a really good example. So I, I guess I would just add to that to say that um, I absolutely think we have to shift culture, and I, I, I do believe that most often culture precedes change, and um, we have to change hearts and minds in order to shift policy. 
uh, and I think the most lasting change, even as we see some of those changes fall backwards again, are usually the result of generations of work around changing people's hearts and shifting their minds. And so for me, one way that I found that's practical to try to do that work is through experimentation and prototyping. Socializing change, don't worry. We're just gonna move it over here for now. And if you don't like it, we'll move it back. And a lot of that work, just in, in collaboration with community, to say, how would you like your street, your sidewalk, your neighborhood, your classroom to feel different? And even if that difference feels too far away, too much change, too hard, let's try it. Let's just try it. And, and I think a lot of times the trying and the socializing and the being in that change is a way to move towards more permanent and collaborative change. Thank you. Christopher. Well, I, I think earlier today I talked a little bit about some of the more formal processes of uh, creating a research network, building up the evidence base, uh, and <clears throat> then uh, synthesizing that evidence into recommendations for uh, governments, member states, uh, uh, to advise on uh, changing the policy to something more proactive. But I think that's the formal answer. Uh, the, the informal answer sometimes is just simply to embody it. And I'll, I'll give an example. A few weeks ago, I was in Moldova. Um, I had been invited by a, a, a group of healthcare clowns, actually, um, uh, to, well, it's true. I, I, here, I can uh -oh. prove it. Uh -oh. So, I, I, I'd been invited by a group of healthcare clowns to uh, go to Moldova to provide uh, psychosocial support for the Ukrainian refugees. And um, I was advised by some colleagues uh, to, uh, who asked me, you know, what is my mission there? And I said, it's just simply to observe. Uh, and, they said, well, make sure you don't endorse anybody, make sure you don't endorse the approach, uh, there's no evidence that it works, blah, 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 blah. And <clears throat> I, I, sure, absolutely. So I, I, I wrote my, um, my, my mission briefing uh, that we're required to do when we travel officially, uh, which described how I was gonna observe the clowns in action to see if it was going to work. And that briefing was shared with the Ministry of Health, it was shared with some of the partner NGOs, it was shared with the country office, etc. And none of them had heard about healthcare clowning at all and, and wondered about it and asked, is WHO now recommending this? And I said, no, 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 we're just here to observe, just here to observe. And uh, so the questions started coming up and they started inviting people to start explaining what this was. And even before I even set foot in the country, there was this bubbling dialogue going on, right? Uh, and then finally, when I did observe the clowns and I saw how they would engage these people who were exhausted, who uh, were, were seeing the future in front of them as, a, as an empty abyss, and then suddenly, to do a pratfall, to sing a, a silly song, to uh, engage the children with a soap bubble, uh, very simple things, and, and, and to see the expression on their face go from wearied anxiety to a laugh, and, and a child laughing for the first time in three months because she couldn't sleep after her apartment building was hit by a missile. Um, and to have that laugh go viral with all the other children like a spring rain hitting parched earth and seeing the flowers suddenly bloom and the parents crying because they hadn't heard that so sound in so long. But no, there's no evidence that it actually works. But I'm just observing this and, and telling that story, uh, but it's not evidence. Um, and so the result now, uh, through no advocacy, no recommendations, is that performing arts groups such as healthcare clownings are, are, are being invited to the table uh, to not as an ad hoc implementation because somebody knew somebody else, but as part of the response strategy up front. And, and that's a change, that's a policy change. Uh, but that wasn't done through a formal channel, that was just simply, 
going and observing and shutting up. Wow, thank you. Anita, how about from your own work? Uh, and just, sure. You uh, can keep the uh, nose on if you want to. Would you like so, to? Yeah, no, 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 you don't have to. <laughs> they say that everybody's going to wear a, um, a clown nose. It's hard to follow a clown, but I, I would just add to um, the great comments so far and, and encourage people to think a little bit about the conceptualization of health and well being, particularly the ones that we have in the US. So I spent a lot of time um, working at the community level and nationally um, with organizations like the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation to think about how do we shift American mindset and narratives around health. And um, on, on one hand, there's a great uh, growing interest into a broader conceptualization of health, certainly spurred um, by the pandemic, but not only that. Um, however, one of the challenges that we face is that we've got a very strong dominant narrative in the US about what comprises health, um, principally one that's driven by health care as opposed to a broader conceptualization of health and well being. Uh, and this is where artists and cultural leaders can be um, quite critical in disrupting those dominant narratives. Uh, the other thing that's also sobering is how entrenched some of those cultural values are. So um, working against that dominant narrative, how to lift up um, the voices and perspectives of subgroups who might have a much more um, different frame, um, a, a holistic frame on health is very, very difficult. And as we've been talking about health justice and health equity, we've been tracking kind of American views um, since 2015, but throughout the pandemic. And what was sobering was how quickly people reverted to those dominant narratives, whether it was their appreciation of racial inequities um, and their acknowledgement of the existence of racial inequities, or just generally how they conceptualized health and the um, centrality of health in people's lives. Uh, that's what we're working against. And so how to think about that creatively and really take a page from artists and people who understand social movement theory and social mobilization will be key uh, if we're gonna have kind of the disruptive cultural moments in order to actually lead to the policy change. Um, it requires kind of a groundswell. And right now we're, we're butting up against a fairly entrenched, still unfortunately dominant narrative. So. Uh, the hope is that groups like this can be quite helpful in that disruption. Yeah, that's very good. You know, Anita, as I was listening to you, you were really highlighting here, um, you know, these significant challenges uh, that are um, uh, to s driving systemic change and the policy and the practice advancement that is uh, needed there. And I just wanna hear maybe one or two of you, uh, whoever wants to respond uh, in addition to, to that as well. Um, what are some of the most significant challenges that you found to um, dr um, changing, right? Uh, dr um, systemic change, right, in your own work? Uh, I'm sure you've identified those, you've talked about the role of the arts in making a difference. Um, what are the challenges to those? I'll start. I I think we often think of systems as silos, but systems interact with each other. And so really helping to visualize how those systems interact with each other so that our policies aren't just on one agency, but more how those agencies interact. And I did, I did bring a graphic. Yes, please. Just please, real please. quick, only because I'm, I'm a visual You're an arts conference learner. after I'm all, right, Betty? I'm a right, you know. That, that, so this is a graphic that just talks about some historic policies, redlining, deed restrictions, investment in the suburban core, I mean disinvestment in the urban core that, that is alongside disinvestment along with investment in suburbia. You know, and so you have these policies that fit into each other. And when you think about it almost like the Dr. Seuss machine, we shouldn't be surprised that there are inequitable health outcomes. And so when we think about policy solutions, rather than just thinking about undoing one policy or one agency's policies or practices, we have to think about how they interact with each other and be willing to create wedges that slow that production down. And so getting policymakers into their art mind or getting change makers into that art mind where they can really start envisioning something that they can take into 
creating change or, or thinking about something new. And I, I see it as both an opportunity and a challenge. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so. Absolutely, great, thank you. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I think I would just lift that and also lift what Tasha was saying earlier. Um, I, I, I think a, a very big barrier for us is that we can't step back and imagine what is actually possible. And I don't think we believe enough that we can completely break things apart and try things anew. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, just many of you have mentioned uh, and other panelists have mentioned as well when you, uh, the importance of yes, policy, right? Uh, but this notion of changing hearts and minds and notions of reimagining. And I just think that's so important. You know, uh, I teach a course in, in political thought uh, and sometimes I look at uh, the work of like Martin Luther King Jr. A lot of people haven't read this one essay called The Ethical Demands of Integration, right? And he's talking in the 60s, but you know, he says law can get you desegregation, but it can't get you genuine integration, right? You know, law policy is absolutely essential, necessary. Uh, we have to have it, uh, but other work is needed in addition uh, to that as well. And I see uh, hearing that as being a common theme uh, in terms of looking at the arts, right? culture shifting that yeah Christopher it's deficits <clears throat> it's deficits versus assets yeah yeah you know? yeah and and in a way our hospital systems are designed for that because uh, once you no longer have symptoms you're released right yeah, yeah. Uh, and it's uh, it, it's as if um, you know after you've been through this experience uh, that's often extremely traumatic mm -hmm. right uh, you're you're released to carry on with your life and nobody follows up and it, it, it's almost as if the emphasis is on simply prolonging your life, not necessarily the quality of yeah. that life. Yeah, that's right. And, and that's important. I mean, what, yeah. what, is, what, what, what does a doctor say to a patient, essentially? The doctor says, what's the matter with you? Hmm. An artist will say, what matters to you? Hmm. And, hmm. and that's, both, both are needed. Mm -hmm. And I think part of the problem, we talk about systemic, uh, uh, obstacles. Uh, one of them is actually who's actually making the policy, identifying that because it's different from place to place. Um, in most of the places I work, it's the government. Uh, in the U.S., it's not. They've abdicated that role to the private sector. Uh, so that means what you measure is, is to satisfy the incentives of insurance carriers or uh, hospital conglomerates uh, who are interested in efficiency measures, who are interested in the deficit measures, uh, but may not be intuitively or as reflexively interested in the kinds of measures that actually add value to your life. Mm. And, um, and, and so that's part of the challenge that we face is by all means show that uh, this intervention um, makes hospital stays shorter, uh, uh, reduces the cost of pharmaceuticals or, or whatever else, but then also show the asset measures uh, in the community. Um, there's great work being done at the University of Denver on these kinds of asset-based community measures of, of building trust, of building uh, bonds, uh, and, and how that impacts uh, creativity, productivity, sense of well-being, et cetera, that are, are positive rather than just negative. Yeah, absolutely. So th I think the U.S. has the steepest hill to climb, actually, of mm -hmm. all the countries that I work in. Interesting. Wow. Well, thank you. Um, we have time for uh, one last question here, and, um, and maybe this should have been the first question, perhaps, for us. Uh, but given the deep political polarization in the United States, and we think about questions of policy, uh, and we know that our body politic is made up of many different people with uh, many different uh, values. Uh, what keeps you motivated uh, to do uh, the work? Uh, are you optimistic? Not uh, being here. Yeah, right. <laughs> are you optimistic about the role of the arts in creating healthy communities in our present moment? Uh, how would you kind of describe your orientation? Maybe what would you say to everyone listening in in terms of um, how you would encourage them in this work? And let's maybe start with Anita. Yeah, I'm actually really encouraged at the community level. I mean, I think um, national politics are, are tough and particularly in the US, but at the community level, there is a lot of experimentation. There are examples of civil society organizations and grassroots organizations working 
with government. People do have a new language around health producing communities. Um, there's movement on the well-being front in a way that we've not seen in the US and in, in Europe and in parts of Asia and South America, this has been um, more longstanding as a measure of uh, beyond economic progress. In the US, we're just catching up to that conversation. So I think there are these bright spots um, and windows of opportunity uh, for that. Uh, but, the, but the question will be, um, how do we kind of working at those, those seams uh, to the earlier comment between sectors and systems, how are we making choices that don't get in our own way? Um, and how are we thinking and prioritizing um, kind of greater measures of assets or well being uh, over and above kind of our traditional measures? And in some cases, that means getting rid of some stuff in order to help to disrupt and change our own mindset and our own narrative. So I'm really encouraged at what I see at the, at the kind of the super local level, probably more so unfortunately than I see at the, the larger federal conversation. Thank you. <laughs> no, I didn't want that. <laughs> no. um, I think when I become really discouraged I, I look to young people in communities and I get into conversation with them um, because... I'm sorry, Betty. I just want to make note that she looked at me when she said that about the young people. <laughs> just, just a note, right? Just a note. So, just saying, just saying. I'm just saying. I no. think you look great. <laughs> but I've digressed. I've digressed. <laughs> and I could have been looking at myself. Um, but you know, and listening, because I think, I think their creativity, their, um, their willingness to step out and be courageous is, is still there. And, and I think, Christopher, you said it, and listening and observing, and not trying to go and teach. You know, because that's where you know, inspiration comes from, it's from pausing and letting something else soak into you. Said. Yeah, and I, I'm optimistic. Um, I think kind of because I have to be. I don't know how else to, I have to believe we have to keep trying. Um, but I will say that, especially through the past couple of years, that I, I experience um, leaders, policymakers, you know, leaders in other sectors, things like this, um, to be much more clear that the arts are essential. Um, We've done maybe too good of a job at making the case. I think we should stop making the case and just continue to demonstrate the consequential impact that art has in people's lives. And I think if we do that, they will not stay at the edge where they are now, where it's like, I get it up here, but I don't know it. I don't know what it is. We need people to know what it is. It needs to be part of our lives. And so I'm optimistic that we're, we're there, um, but we have to keep demonstrating that impact? Well, I would say the most optimistic thing in terms of the policymakers that I've engaged with in the US is that it seems from my uh, anecdotal experience that um, it's a nonpartisan issue uh, that it doesn't matter where you are on the political spectrum, uh, for the most part, you're in favor of creativity, you're in favor of community, you're in favor of better health and well being. And I think as long as we can frame that uh, uh, successfully, I, I don't see why that shouldn't grow and continue. So I, I'm, I'm quite optimistic that we can turn this into a movement. And, the <clears throat> and, and without watering down the uh, social justice equity aspect of it, uh, but by demonstrating through compassion, through empathy, why it's important to all of us, because we're all, the, the races are a mental construct. They, they don't exist biologically. We're one species. And, and reminding people of that, uh, demonstrating that, acting as if that is true, because it is, uh, will go a long way to achieving this revolution of the heart that we so desperately need. Well, thank you so much. Uh, I just want to close our session here uh, just by sharing just a quick little story from my childhood, and I'll make this brief, right? Uh, so I grew up in the southeast part of the United States, and uh, the summers were pretty hot and humid. And my uh, family had a, a family friend, he was a carpenter, and my dad asked him to come build a storage shed in our backyard one summer. And uh, this guy's name was Mr. T, uh, not to be confused with the 1980s, 18, like Mr. T. 
but Mr. T nevertheless. And so Mr. T, in my eyes, as an eight or nine year old, was just a big dude, and I really liked him. And so I tried to help. I was like, well, hey, how can I help? And so I would bring nails and some uh, lumber to, the, uh, to him and the other guy who was working with him. And so the guy who was working with him was sitting under a pecan tree that we had in our backyard. And uh, Mr. T said, son, I want you to go over there and tell him to come back before he gets shade poisoning. I thought to myself, shade poisoning? I said, that sounds kind of serious. So I walked over and said, hey, Mr. T, why don't you come back before you get shade poisoning? So he gets his stuff and he goes back, but I was a little unnerved, right, about shade poisoning because I didn't know what it was. Uh, and I spent a lot of time under that pecan tree as well, and I was concerned that I may have had shade poisoning, and more importantly, how do I even get rid of it, right, if I have it? So I ran in the house, and my mom was at the kitchen sink, and I said, Mom, Mr. T was worried about this guy out here getting shade poisoning. Uh, what is that? And so she just kind of smiled at me. She said, why don't you go and ask Mr. T that? So I walked back outside kind of sheepishly. He was on his ladder. He looks down at me and basically says, yes, yeah, son. I said, um, uh, Mr. T, uh, what's shade poisoning? And he walks down from the ladder. He just looks, shakes his head and looks at me and said, oh, son, shade poisoning ain't nothing but laziness. And then he said, but don't worry about that. Come on, we have work to do. And so I just want to encourage us that we don't uh, be subject to spiritual shade poisoning and recognize that we all have collective work to do to create communities of health justice. Thank you so much. Thank you to the panelists here. Thank you, Anita, Christopher, Betty, Deborah.